My name is Bernhard Lersch. Well, uh, in standard general relativity, C is in fact not a dimensional constant. If you give me a space like four vector, I can write this as a difference of two future oriented time like four vectors. The length of these vectors I can measure with atomic clocks, and I can also measure the length of the sum of these two space like, uh, time like vectors. And then I apply the parallel parallelogram identity and determine the length of the original space like vector. So, in other words, you can measure spatial distances with atomic clocks. And as a consequence of that, all relative speeds are number valued quantities. They are not dimensional quantities. Yes. And uh, if you look at the relative velocities of particles that move on the null cone, you discover that these velocities are actually absolute and not relative. They are independent of the choice of the reference four vector that you relate to. And the value of this absolute velocity is one. You don't have to put it equal to one. It is one. But that's because you've assumed... And okay. <laughs> you've assumed this is <laughs> not a question of choice of units. You can measure your velocities in centimeter per second, inches per second, or whatever you want. Because all of these uh, units, centimeters, inches, and so on, they are also time units. So C doesn't have to be put equal to one, it is one. And by no means this number depends on anything. So I think the fact you spent five minutes explaining all this just says that you have to come up with the, dy with the whole dynamics of GR to make this statement. If I give you a theory, if I give you, if I give you, if I give you a theory, if I give you a theory which doesn't, is not like this, breaks Lorentz invariance, doesn't have not have light cones, and so on. You would not be doing that, right? And I think that's the point. You are clearly, you should set or not set or derive or do whatever, C to one if you have GR, of course. We don't have GR, that's the point. We have a dynamics which is totally different. And that is the point. I'm not doubting that if you have GR, you're being very clever by deriving C to be one or setting C equals one. I have a dynamics which is different, simply is different. Thank you very much. Um, first, a tiny historical point. I may be completely wrong, but I've only read Galileo in translation, like, like most of us, but I've never seen him discuss little g as a universal constant in the sense that Einstein discusses C in 1905. And this but, was you know, an analogy, you're right. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. But any, um, more uh, a sort of deeper point, I would say, is on, on the homogeneity problem. I mean, if I understand correctly, even with the most and uh, you know, extremely interesting theories, but with the most conservative version of VSL, as you, as you put it yourself, you, you do bring yourself to a new, shall we say, a modified dynamics, a new version of dynamics, no matter what way it works. Whereas, you know, I think you made a comment in the early days, which was a very good one about inflation winning by default, at least before VSL mm -hmm. theories came along. But I, I would put to you that inflation still wins by default. And the reason it d wins by default, for me anyway, is from a philosophical point of view, in inflationary theories, all you're doing is dropping one assumption, and the assumption you're dropping is that the expansion in the inf infant universe should bear any relation to the sort of expansion we see in the adult universe. So you've, you've literally dropped an assumption about the universe. So in, from that point of view, it's very, uh, it's very conservative. I was really pleased that you didn't go down the route of you know, popular science magazines where you have an expansion of 10 to the alpha divided by a time of 10 to the minus beta, and it looks absolutely ridiculous, because I think that's a very weak argument, actually. It's like saying the number of atoms in this room is extravagant. But would you not agree that it, in, in, in that sense, inflation is actually extremely efficient, shall we say, as a theory? You know, I think it's probably because I got older and I, I started caring less and less about the homogeneity problem, the flatness problem, blah, blah, blah. Those things are just like errors of the youth. You know, we, I think what, the, what really matters is explaining the fluctuations. The fluctuations are, you can have all these philosophical issues about homogeneity and isotropy, which are fine-tuning problems. The real fine-tuning problem, in my mind, is really explain why n is 0.96, why a is 10 to the minus 5. Do we have gravity waves? I mean, this has really a more hands-on attitude. And to be honest, we, the various things I described to you, or only this 
you know, founded 2007 onwards. So it was really the second generation of papers. Uh, I do think VSL solves the homogeneity problem. And the best way to do that would be like with a um, thermal bath, because you would homogenize a thermal bath. And then the fluctuations are actually different, because it's the thermal fluctuations. And it's something I didn't mention here for simplicity, but you do solve the homogeneity problem. The flatness problem is a different issue, OK? And but I'm not disputing that you solve yeah. it. I'm just saying the cost is quite high. The, price the cost is, is massive, high. but that's, that's the fun bit, isn't it? Because, of course, you are questioning things about foundations of physics, unlike inflation. And you may think this is bad. I think it's good, because it's the only way we're ever going to learn anything. But that's my, my attitude. Yeah. John Barrow. Um, an interesting thing, I think, about these sorts of theories that you describe for, this, for the variation of some quantity like big G that's got dimensions, that, that we get this conservation equation for a scalar field or, or for big G, and it's always a second-order partial differential equation. So when you integrate it, uh, you get a couple of constants of integration which have the same dimensions as the constant that you are now varying. So you can always make a dimensionless combination, presumably by dividing your C of T, say, by your integration constant. So, so you're sort of guaranteed a dimensionless combination because you're integrating differential equations. But that does mean that you know, I if you had a theory for varying C, there's an integration constant which is a constant which has got dimensions of a velocity. So you've sort of created a new I mean, in a way, constant. You think that's right? I think it's right. And in addition, it connects with all these issues about the fact that you, know, you do have these ways of defining units which are, are wonderful in GR. Because you always recover GR in some limit. So for example, in the form dispersion relations, in the infrared, C goes to a constant, right? So it's, uh, you can always not only use those integration constants, as a way to form dimensionless variables, but they can actually be the infrared versions of the theory to which you reduce the if the theory, range. exactly. So I think it's, uh, to my mind, this is a red herring, and I only pointed this out because it always brings all kinds of complaints. And we were in a, actually a conference of last July of supposed observers and experimentalists, and this issue came up so many times, I just got sick of it and decided to spend 15 minutes on it. No. Simon Preval, um, this is going to sound a bit witchcrafty, but um, one thought I've, I've had is um, why should the universe actually prefer one particular set of units over another? I mean, obviously, we can always change our units to make something constant. Um, but um, from if we follow your argument we sh um, that we should be considering dimensionless constants, is there any way to perhaps formulate our physical theories um, without referring to any set of units? No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a simple answer, and I challenge you to do that. You invariably, I mean, you could always find these very complex ways. Of, you know, of course, I mean, at some point, you have to define a way of measuring your unit, of defining your units of measurement. And that is always informed by your dynamics, clearly. And then, and then you do form, at this stage, you do form dimensionless ratios, is what you're measuring and your unit which does not erase the fact that your unit has been defined conventionally based on a given dynamics. So you're not really, you're just hiding the issue when you do these dimensionless things. Yeah. 